Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, How to Gain Creative Competitive Insights from Your Organization's Collective Competitor Knowledge. My name is Raina Michaeli. I happen to be the director of the Institute for Competitive Intelligence. And as you might know, my company, this Institute for Competitive Intelligence, hosts these webinars in our insight series. That's how we call trendy um, sessions about advancements, about new techniques, tools, or simply players in the discipline of competitive slash market intelligence. Today, my guest speaker is Jonathan Gordon Till. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, hello there, uh, Rainer. Yes, <laughs> just a quick check that our line is really open because otherwise it's a bit boring just having me here on the line. <laughs> yeah, our session today will pretty much last about 25, 30 minutes of formal presentation from Gordon Till, from Jonathan Gordon Till. And then after this bit, he will be uh, answering your questions. Unfortunately, we can't open your microphones. That would be a bit noisy and a bit of a panic and hectic. So please use the chat function that everybody should see on the uh, go to meeting uh, window. Just typing your questions throughout the whole presentation. And then in the end of our presentation, uh, Jonathan will be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, but let me first introduce a little bit about Jonathan. We know each other, of course, in person. Unfortunately, we're not sitting next to each other, so he's over there in the UK. I'm sitting here in Germany, but that's the, of course, beauty and power of modern technology that we can team up for this presentation. Uh, Jonathan is principal at the Oxford Business Intelligence a company specializing in knowledge management strategy, particularly with reference to knowledge retention and transfer during corporate change. He has worked by now for over 25 years at this intersection between knowledge and information management, competitive intelligence, and library science. He is active in the global uh, knowledge and information profession, and he has served on a number of professional bodies, including the SCIP ethics company uh, committee. He's also widely acknowledged as an information ethicist and uh, provides training consultancy throughout uh, the InfoEthics UK. Uh, he has contributed already wildly to the professional literature and was for many years a columnist, for example, in the Information World Review. Earlier in his career, he has started as knowledge and information management consultant in global financial services. And in addition to knowledge management consultancy, uh, he currently leads the global knowledge management center of expertise for the R&D function of a major food manufacturer. I guess this is pretty impressive. This is somebody with as I've said already, more than 25 years by now in this discipline. And of course, we're keen to learn from you, Jonathan. So here we go. I think it's now your turn to introduce a bit of this whole notion of uh, knowledge management inside an organization. And of course, helping us hopefully better understand and implement tools and techniques along these lines. All yours, Jonathan. Well, Rona, thank you very much indeed. That's a very kind introduction. Um, I, I hope I can do justice to that. Um, as, as you said just a few moments ago, I've been working at the intersection between knowledge management, information management, and competitive intelligence for some years. And what I've seen really sitting from the perspective now of knowledge management is that there are some disciplines, some tools and tricks of the trade that I'm pretty sure could be really valuable in the competitive intelligence space. Uh, 
So for the next 35 minutes or so, I want to share with you some of these tricks, some of these methods, just a few of them, which I think will be valuable components of any competitive intelligence program, and certainly um, to show how uh, collective knowledge can help to develop and deliver competitive insights across any organization. So the first objective is really to recognize the value of this internal uh, knowledge, whether it's from the individual expert or, or regular member of staff or the collective knowledge of all of those people. And indeed, whether it's competitive knowledge, competitive intelligence you're looking for, or really any other kind of, of knowledge or intelligence from across your organization, in this case today, for today's webinar, we're looking at the competitive landscape. Now, I want to focus not so much on what an individual knows, although the individual is the critical component in uh, understanding the competitive landscape, but looking at how we can mobilize, get groups of people, groups of staff and colleagues together to identify critical competitor knowledge. And all of this, all the while, is without any particular IT solution. So I might just emphasize that once or twice as we go into this webinar. The starting premise, very important from the knowledge management perspective, is that most of what we need to know within our organization, I think, is already within the organization. So of course there will be stuff that is outside, of course there will be stuff that we can't access very easily, but a very large proportion of what we need to know resides in the heads of our colleagues, our employees, and, and consultants. This is not about big data, you know, this is not about analyzing huge databases of terabytes of information, terabytes of data. Of course, you can do that. But what I want to share with you today are some of the methods that just involve fairly basic conversation. So the greatest tool we've got in our organizations, the most valuable tool is the human. And it's the collective knowledge, the collective insight of all of those people. So there's no need for any expensive database these are things that we can do pretty much in everyday operational time. Some of the things I will share with you require a little organization. That's nothing new, but nothing beyond what you would ordinarily do for, say, team meetings or larger group meetings. These are very, very ordinary techniques. But I want to start with just a few definitions so that we're clear what we're talking about here. On the one hand, I want us to acknowledge that there is a lot of content, there is information, even knowledge available in documents. So the stuff that you will find in databases, typically the transactional kind of stuff, the, you know, the documents and files from our HR systems, from our supplier database and so on. That's one kind of what I call explicit knowledge, the stuff that we can tangibly move around, we can delete, we can edit. Today's webinar is not focusing on that. It's focusing on the other major kind of knowledge, which is tacit knowledge. This is the stuff that is experiential. It's in our heads. It's based on observation, on experiences through our careers and our everyday work. It's typically stuff that doesn't get documented. So think here of the times you've been out to see a client, you've, you've maybe been to see a supplier, you've made some observations, you've gone back to your office, maybe you've spoken with somebody about those observations, but you think they're not worth documenting, they stay in my head. It's those individual observations collectively, in context, that can be very, very powerful. But the challenge is how to identify those individual observations, how to make sense of them in context. So you have something that in competitive intelligence circles you would call strategic actionable intelligence. I'll show you how in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. So pausing just for a moment to consider the different sources of competitor information. There's the internal 
um, explicit database. So the HR data, the financial data, all the stuff that we've got on our SAP systems, for example, you know, records, management information, all the emails, all the terabytes of emails. Of course, there is huge value in that, and I, I'm not for one moment dismissing the value. I, I think that is incredibly important because it's something that we can deal with very quickly and efficiently, and we can find uh, you know, the answer to many, many operational questions. Below the red line, the red dotted line on my chart, is the more intangible, tacit information or knowledge. So think here about uh, the best practices. Think about the experiences, as I mentioned a few moments ago, of the sales force going out and observing what their customers are doing. Think about relationships. That's not documented information. That's about trust. It's about acquaintance. It's about how you get along with someone. Ideas, career experiences, rumors. Okay, rumors are very rarely documented, but they stay in people's heads and they circulate through conversation. So as we get towards the bottom of our chart, we've got what I would say is increasing potential value, but increasing difficulty in being able to manipulate. In fact, increasing difficulty in finding. And another key difference between explicit and tacit knowledge is that explicit knowledge tends to be more about the know what, what was done. Tacit knowledge tends to be more about why something happened, why was a decision made. And those why decisions were made is very rarely documented, but it's absolutely vital to understanding the way we our organizations operate and the way we need to make decisions in the future. And that's where I think a lot of competitive intelligence can be found. Why is this difficult? I haven't found anyone in, in the years I've been talking about knowledge management who finds any of this counterintuitive. It's all quite regular to have a conversation, to talk about knowledge, to talk about experiences. But many organizations don't optimize these processes. It is true that the majority of, of knowledge and information that we need is within the organization. So if that is the case, why is it that we're so bad at, at um, manipulating this, this knowledge and intelligence? Well, I think the, the quotation that's given here is absolutely spot on. Changing employee behavior is 90% of the challenge. So the content, the information, the knowledge might be available but how we go about recognizing it, how we share it, and how we make sense of it, that's something that is somewhat less intuitive, and we need a behavior change. Okay, So it's intellectually not challenging, but it is very specific to the person and to the organization. The two guiding principles just at the, uh, to set the scene here are tacit knowledge and collective knowledge. So tacit knowledge may, may apply to the individual. Of course, it's about my experiences in the context of my observation. Collective knowledge is where we bring all of that together. So what is true of a typical team meeting or a typical conference is a direct a transfer of information or knowledge. It's rather inefficient because you don't get the context, you don't get the experiences of the listeners, of the delegates, if you like, making a collective um, sense of what's being transferred. Compare that with a group conversation. And, and this is one of the, the, the key tricks I want to present as we look at some of these methods. A group conversation is much more powerful than uh, a single expert presenting to a team of people. Should I put these onto um, a spectrum of opportunity. On the one hand, um, some techniques, some methods are semi-formal. I don't want to say they're formal because that gives the impression that they, they require structure and, and significant organization and resource. That's not true in the methods that I want to share with you. So we'll look at unconference as a way of 
uh, mobilizing knowledge. This is a technique that we'll be using at the upcoming um, ICI conference in, in Bad Neuheim uh, next week, a very useful method for exploiting collective knowledge. It doesn't require a huge amount of organization, but it is semi-formal. It is a one-time event. We'll take a look at knowledge cafes and also some of the other activities that you can do whilst you're attending a conference, such as, as next week's uh, meeting in Germany. And then there are the truly informal uh, meetings between experts, between groups of people. Communities of practice, which I really won't say too much about, but are widely documented in knowledge management literature, are organic um, groupings of like-minded individuals that take place across a large geography, or any geography uh, for that matter. What makes them specific is that they are not um, directed. They grow, they develop organically. So members join and leave a community of practice over a period of weeks or months or years. And the community develops as an organic collective. And that's where things like trust, understanding, mutual relationships can form between the experts and in knowledge management, um, in, in the knowledge management space, these are really, really powerful um, uh, tools for mobilizing organizations' knowledge. But the tool I will look at today and explain in a bit more detail is around randomized coffee trials and the concept of slow networking. What makes all of these methods so particularly useful is that they bring an element of serendipity so that um, occasional discovery that you get by not forcing an agenda. If the conditions are right, if the environment, so I mean literally the physical environment, the room, the venue, the location, if those things are right, if they are informal, if they are conducive to open, honest discussion, then serendipity occurs and the articulation of critical aha knowledge, those insights can happen. But to do all of those things, you do need some element of behavioral change, um, which I, I think is, is common for everyone. The tendency, the natural tendency for, for people in organizations is to present what they think they, the audience wants to hear. The methods I want to talk about today are rather more informal. They're about telling it like it is. They may be subjective comments, rumors, things that have been heard, but collectively those can be validated. So let me start with the first method. This is the, the most exciting technique, I think, because it gives a number of opportunities for other techniques within it. It's the unconference. So unconference is a group of people, perhaps organically, spontaneously formed, who come together to talk about topics that they themselves have identified. It can work with any size of, of group, so from, say, a dozen people, 10, 15 people, up to 500, even 1,000. So any normal size group of people. The key trick, though, is that the delegates themselves are the ones who set the agenda. As a result, unlike a traditional conference or a traditional team meeting, everything is 100% relevant to the people who are there because they have set the agenda. So by definition, they are going to want to participate. In other words, you are not being sent to a conference or pulled into a team meeting because your manager says you have to go there. Go to an unconference, propose a topic to be discussed. And if that topic is discussed, of course, you will be interested. You will participate. And participation is what draws out that insight, the knowledge, the tacit knowledge that's in our heads. There is this peculiar um, notion of the law of two feet. 
So this again is something that you rarely find in a traditional meeting. In fact, it's something that you never find in a very important, uh, let's say a management meeting. You dare not walk out of your manager's meeting, for example, or your project meeting. With an unconference, you are recommended to leave the meeting if you feel you are unable to contribute to it. Why waste your time? Why create um, or miss out on the opportunity of being somewhere else if you feel you simply have to be polite and sit in to listen to a meeting that you're not interested in? So the law of two feet says, get up and go somewhere else to do something more useful if you're not able to contribute or you don't want to. Those who attend the meeting are the right people to be there. So the only thing that you need is some passion, some open-mindedness, and of course, some time to talk. And later on, I'll say um, that the, the right amount of time, it depends on the kind of meeting you're, uh, you're holding, what you hope to get from it, but also about the, the context and the, the organization. Informal and open conversation is critical. So again, unlike this particular webinar I'm presenting right now, there should be absolutely no PowerPoint. Imagine that, a meeting without PowerPoint, something that has no prepared speech, no prepared agenda. The topics are proposed, but the meeting evolves organically. What happens will happen. The conversation will go the way it does. And because it's being guided by the participants, by the delegates, they are the ones doing the talking. It is therefore 100% relevant. So tacit and experiential knowledge is elicited, comes out of the people's mouths, and it can be captured. How to do this? Well, just very briefly, I won't go into all these points in great detail. We don't have the time. But you, know, you, you need to organize a date and, and find a venue for these meetings. I would suggest, if you have the opportunity, um, find the most comfortable venue possible. So if you have something like a conference center, if you can do something off-site, so away from your usual office location, because that, uh, that is where you'll detract people from the, the frustrations they have within their offices, within their employers' uh, four walls. Find a neutral venue, if possible. Propose a broad theme. I mean, clearly you don't want to have um, an unconference or any kind of meeting without any kind of uh, topic to discuss, but something which is relevant to a number of people that will attract their interest. How will the merger, the upcoming merger with uh, one of our competitors uh, affect our competitive strategy? Is the sort of broad topic which has many, many subtopics within it, and that could create a great opportunity for a rich, rich discussion at an unconference. In terms of timing, it is difficult to say what is optimum for time. As a minimum, I would say one hour because as with all meetings where you get a group of people together, the first 10 minutes is, is taken up with uh, you know, people moving around, getting settled in. Momentum doesn't develop until about 20 minutes into a meeting. And you need some time for um, arguments and discussions to take their course. Everyone should uh, be given the opportunity to propose a topic of interest and then vote on those topics of interest. There's our little photograph below shows we've got a bulletin board there where folk are simply proposing topics to discuss at the, um, at the unconference. They're sponsors of the topics, if you like. They don't have to be protagonists. They don't have to stand and demonstrate or, or represent the topic, but they are there because they want to uh, talk or share experience of, for example, uh, some market intelligence or some observations they've made of their competitive environment. Attend those particular sessions that interest you and don't forget to observe the law of two feet. So move around between the sessions, find those ones that are particularly interesting. So imagine you're surfing the television, you're, you're channel hopping. 
that's absolutely okay because you will stay at the ones that are relevant for you. Let them self-organize. So if subtopics uh, come up during the discussion, let those develop into conversations. In fact, let the groups break apart if somebody wants to create a, a new topic within one of these smaller groups. Let them go to one side of the room, let them go somewhere else and start a little group, a little puddle. Capture the conversation if you can. Um, I, I don't think that there's any particular optimum way of doing that. I personally like to record with video or dictaphone, but it depends on the organization. It depends on your culture and behaviors. And then move to another session uh, when, when you're bored or you want to contribute somewhere else. The particular tricks that make unconferencing uh, a, a useful method are some of these. So informality is always the best. I can't, uh, I can't emphasize that enough. The more formal and driven by an agenda you make a meeting, the less opportunity there is for off-topic, off-agenda issues to come in, for things to be raised that perhaps one of the quieter members of the audience uh, doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable in talking about. You know, if, if somebody dominates the meeting, if there's no opportunity for everyone to have a voice, if there's more structure and formality around the committee meeting type of uh, event, it's very difficult to get those gems, those real insights of experience and subjective observation coming into the conversation. Think of a fun way of voting for the, the topics to, to consider. So ideally, during the bulletin board stage, you'll have a number of uh, proposals to talk about. In most organizations, in most cases, there won't be the opportunity at that moment to talk about every particular topic. So you'll want to vote on the, the top topics, for example, the top five or six topics. Dotmocracy is a great way of doing that. It's very simple. If you haven't come across Dotmocracy, it's simply putting a sticky dot against the topic to show your vote for that particular thing. Um, avoid the particular conference mindset. So I mentioned some of these things before. Don't allow PowerPoint unless you absolutely have to because you want to show some critical technical information. In a spontaneous, organic conversation, there should be no need for PowerPoint, no need for any pre-planned agenda in your conversation. Let it flow. The way it goes is the way it is meant to go. Encourage a diversity of, of delegate, of opinion, of experience. Bring different people, encourage different people to attend. So not the usual suspects. In a project team meeting, you will tend to invite the project team members, the ones who are intimately involved with the project. With an unconference event, everyone within the organization, or the logical part of it, is invited to attend. And you don't want to exclude people because they might be the people who have the critical experience, those observations that don't get noticed because they're not documented, or because those people are not part of the traditional project teams. So encourage that diversity of participation. Allow the topics under discussion to drift. If they stay within the overall theme, let's say, what's the impact of our merger with, with competitor X going to mean for us? Um, so long as it's within that broad remit, that's fine. The value of topic drift is that you're focusing the conversation on what people want to talk about. People shouldn't feel constrained into talking about only what's on the agenda. There may be other more important topics to cover. Certainly, um, that plays into the, uh, the time factor. Allow enough time for those topics to have, uh, to have a fair discussion. If necessary, uh, continue the conversation later on. And as, as my last point here says, um, use that opportunity 
after the unconference event, not only to nurture those new contacts you've made, that new intelligence, but to explore topics that you were just starting to talk about, those things that you know you really need to have a conversation about, but you don't have the documentation. Start another unconference. Get a, another informal meeting together. When the meeting is over, it's over. Don't feel that you've got to sit there politely looking at each other, making polite conversation, simply because you haven't used up all the time. After 20 minutes, it's fine. Let the meeting stop. If it continues, let it continue, if you've got the opportunity to do that. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, if you have the opportunity, it's always a good time to record these conversations. One of the biggest, I think, weaknesses of any traditional conference is there is a lot of new information. There's stuff that's captured or very, very, uh, at a very high level presented on a, on a PowerPoint presentation. But it's those little gems that the presenter or somebody will uh, create spontaneously, perhaps, during the presentation. Now, if you don't write those down during a conversation or during a presentation, you will miss them. So I find recording conversations, at least on a dictaphone, indexing that so that you know what the meeting covered, what the critical observations were, then you can at least refer back to that. It does depend largely on the culture, the, the behaviors of the organization, and it may not be for every organization, but where it happens, it, it's a very, very useful um, thing to have. So moving on from the unconference as a collective event, as a group event, I now want to talk about how we could atomize a group of people into smaller clusters. So um, Nesta, which is a, a UK innovation charity, developed this concept of randomized coffee trials. So it's a, a play on the, the concept of randomized clinical trials in which two people, two separate um, people within the organization are randomly connected. I've heard of organizations where they do it between groups of four people, but I think the, the connections between two people give opportunity for trust and a, an interesting relationship to develop. What Nesta did and what other organizations have started to do is set up a, a regular meeting between random pairings of people across the organization. So this is ideal for those organizations that might be global or uh, geographically disparate. Uh, people who want to participate in this sort of um, exercise opt in to the regular meeting schedule. They're assigned a random pairing, so typically with people they don't know. And the, the meetings are held a mutually convenient way. So over coffee is, I suppose, the cliche um, around the, the water cooler or in the virtual um, equivalent. There's no agenda. There's no um, expectation of any particular outcome. But this is time set aside for two people, maybe to spend 30 minutes or one hour speaking with each other on whatever topic they want to choose. So it exploits this idea of serendipity. At the moment, I'm participating in a monthly uh, randomized coffee trial um, organized by a, a third party in the UK. In fact, it's, it's a global organization. And every month, I am paired up with somebody I've probably never met, never come across before in the knowledge management profession. And this is really a great opportunity to not just discover um, new ways of doing things, but to gain real professional insight. If your community of randomized coffee trials is within um, Salesforce or within an R&D function, for example, you can begin to exploit those uh, competitor experiences, those observations that you both might have made. And that collective conversation is much more powerful than the individual observation. So you make a note of those um, discoveries, if you like, those 
aha moments in the conversation and you've learned something that is valuable for uh, your competitive intelligence. But it is, of course, a, a great way of developing um, relationships that then continue, ideally, after the conversation. Certainly, if they're within the organization, you have every opportunity of reaching out to those people in the future and using your newfound relationship to dig for uh, competitor information, maybe some intelligence insights. So unlike speed networking, so remember speed networking was all the rage um, over the last few years, a randomized coffee trial takes the opposite perspective. It removes the time constraints. There's no anticipating that moment when the bell is going to ring and you've got to finish that conversation. Take your time. Within the hour, you've got plenty of opportunity to talk. Develop that relationship so you can get together later on. Uh, avoid that uh, sudden single focus of attention on one day. Use it to develop the relationship, to develop the shared interest, um, and use it to develop um, your understanding of critical knowledge because the conversation continues through the trust, through the relationship that you've developed um, during that first meeting. Similar principles apply, but at the group level, where you have what's called a world cafe. This is something that I think a lot of organizations have taken on board in recent years, and it's exploited in the knowledge management community through uh, what a guy called David Gertine calls the knowledge cafe. So he's developed this method that's now used by many, many organizations who are active in knowledge management as a way of uh, groups discussing a specific topic. So it might be a very specific competitive challenge, a strategic challenge, a technical and operational challenge within your organization. Almost any size group of people come together to talk in a, a structured but informal way. So the structure is having the time-bound conversation. It's having the specific topic to talk about. But the informal nature of it is the level playing field, it's the openness, it's the, the fact that we want to talk about things that didn't work, um, some of the errors, some of the lessons. It's about recognizing that we have a real diversity of opinion. Unlike your traditional uh, conference meeting, where you possibly have a dominant speaker, obviously you have the speaker, but in a, let's say, a team meeting or a project uh, team meeting, you tend to find the dominant people. In a knowledge cafe or a world cafe, everyone has an opportunity. You could use the talking stick method. It's a little bit artificial, but it's fun. Pass a stick, pass the baton around the group, and everyone has an opportunity to speak, whether they're the, the, the reticent introverts like myself, or they're the more um, ebullient, um, emotional uh, extroverts. It highlights listening alongside conversation. So again, this, this is something that you tend not to find at a cafe, uh, at, at a, tri a traditional conference where somebody wants to get a point across and you're listening only to your own head. Listen to the other people in the conversation and you start to form collective insight. Diversity, again, we've talked about already, encourages those uh, contrary views to come out. Um, a predetermined outcome is avoided because there is no predetermined outcome. You're there to discuss a topic. Whether it's right or wrong, there's no particular uh, known answer. You're there to understand each other's opinions, their, their views, their experiences, and see if you reach a conclusion. Ideally, you will reach a conclusion, but you don't want to predetermine that. I would also um, caution those sorts of meetings that end up with a kind of groupthink. So here is the danger of the committee meeting, that sort of meeting that's dominated by the overbearing uh, 
committee member who wants to get their message across and, and their way of doing something. Groupthink can be dangerous. But with a, a world cafe or a knowledge cafe, you have far less opportunity for that to happen because you respect the diversity of opinion, but you enable the insights, the collective knowledge to come together. And of course, the, the obvious benefit of being able to share, socialize new information and knowledge across a wider group, which you might have the best information systems and technology in the world, but there's nothing better than having a group of people listening, really listening to a conversation and sharing that same experience, far more powerful than, um, than, than, than a, a database or a system. So just very briefly, there are some things that you can do within an existing conference. They don't need a, a lot of, uh, of setting up or, or resource. It sounds a bit silly, but, you know, utilize those, those coffee breaks. Use a lot, utilize the uh, informal uh, opportunities between the formal parts of the, the conference to really exploit informal collective knowledge. Get together with a group of of folk you haven't met, get together with a group of buddies. If this is the opportunity you have to just switch off from the conference and discuss uh, topics of shared interest, because you're there out of your normal work environment, you have the excuse not to look at your email, not to get sidetracked into doing something that is structured. Meet the experts is a nice way of setting up time, a session, to get together with people who declare themselves an expert in something. So, you know, you, you might have a, a simple register at the conference venue of people who declare an interest or an expertise in a particular discipline. It might be an area of the competitive environment. Bring those people together if you can schedule the time between the, the conference presentations to discuss those uh, areas of mutual expertise or mutual interest. Use that to put a question to somebody who, who considers themselves to be an expert in the competitive environment. Uh, use the, the full duration of the conference to find those other experts to perhaps reach a better understanding. A birds of a feather meeting is uh, a fun way of getting a group of people to talk about a shared issue, for example, over lunch. So this, again, is something we'll be doing at the upcoming um, Institute conference next week, where people who have a, a particular um, topic they want to talk about, a, a discipline in competitive intelligence, will host a lunch table. So other delegates will be able to go to that table knowing that there is an expert sitting there uh, to have an informal discussion about. A great way of getting people to share something that they feel comfortable talking about. They're not forced to sit there. They can go and find another table um, or not go to that table in the first place. And a knowledge fair, you could set this up as a, a really formal, a really structured conference in its own right. What I want to propose, though, is using the existing conference, the spaces within the conference, to allow individual experts to host a very small collective gathering on a specific topic at designated times. So it's something that you could use the coffee breaks, the lunch break, but enable um, an expert to host. So to do a very small presentation, have a little, I don't know what to call it, a, a, a kiosk or a, a desk, a table, where they can talk, they can answer questions, they can promote their perspectives. And that's where you will find some of these minority interests, the experiences that are not documented. All those things that the, the sales force, for example, or the uh, customer relationship people know about, but they haven't been able to share any other way. So I've talked about a few very, very simple methods here that mostly involve um, people getting together and talking. 
the individual knowledge, the individual experience, of course, is very powerful, but it's the collective knowledge. What do we make of these issues when we get two or three or more people together, those who have different experiences to uh, apply to a particular topic? That's the greater level of understanding the insight that you will get that you don't find in one person. Informality elicits tacit knowledge. As is, is a well known in knowledge management circles, you cannot conscript knowledge. So you can't torture knowledge out of someone. You can try, and, and, and this is, has been tried in, in past centuries, um, torturing knowledge or intelligence out of someone. But it's far more effective, believe me, if you enable informality. And knowledge flows if it's, uh, if it's able to do so. IT systems, databases, they're just not necessary. I don't think I've, I've really spoken about any particular system in, in this presentation today. They're just not necessary. Of course, they have their value, but don't think of them as the, uh, the, the real must-haves in knowledge uh, sharing or knowledge elicitation. They're not that important. And there is no real need for speed. Think of um, a conversation as something that's part of a, a multi-step process. The conversation can continue after the unconference. It can continue after that randomized coffee trial meeting. Use that initial conversation to spark the interest. Set the seeds of a, a, a relationship. Develop over time trust with other people and then you start to see where your knowledge is coming from. One very final word then for uh, those who have a, an organization that might not be too amenable to informal ways of sharing knowledge. Um, a lot of the messages here might be counterintuitive to your organization's ways of working. You might have formal structure. I really implore you to present these proposals to your senior managers. These are lessons that I think they have to learn. These are not some things that rank and file junior staff particularly uh, need to be too concerned about. The, the barrier tends to be the middle to senior managers who expect to see formal sharing of knowledge, formal documentation. And if it's not happening, it's principally because of behaviors. It's because of the expectation in the organization that uh, knowledge isn't shared. Present these ideas to senior managers and you'll hopefully start to see uh, more and more opportunities for getting folk together to share informally, in group settings, their real tacit knowledge. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for listening, and I think we have to open up now for questions. Is that right, Reiner? Yes. So, thank you very much, Jordan. This was pretty exciting <laughs> presentation, and uh, <laughs> it's always a bit of a thought-provoking, challenging idea. As, as you said, it's kind of back to basics and sort of forget about IT and all the more advanced stuff and toys mm. that we usually use. So, yes, please, um, send your questions via the chat function. So please uh, just type it in. I will then read it out. So Jonathan can obviously um, answer and everybody of course knows what we're talking about. So here we have some questions which without any specific order now, this is just as coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, number one, is there any scientific evidence for the efficacy of this um, methodology that you presented? I guess in terms <laughs> of comparing it to traditional yeah old school kind of thinking that you indicated, of course, is around and has been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. So yes. how do you make up your kind of recommendation here? Okay, um, I, I'm afraid I, I won't be able to give you scientific evidence. I, I haven't looked into the scientific proof, but there is a lot of management literature, which uh, very clearly in my mind presents the efficacy of informality over formality, group over individual. And there's a lot of knowledge management literature that quite clearly um, demonstrates how collective knowledge, collective insight is much more uh, insightful than the individual because you've got context, you've got relevance. 
Um, so I'm not sure that that explicitly answers your question. I'm afraid I don't have uh, a scientific um, background that I could I could. I think the point is rather do it as a kind of empirical study, so a company introducing something like that and then it's before and after, yeah. so it's not really scientific as in clinical testing. It's more like do we have proof, do we have evidence that this is really yes. improving our knowledge sharing ideas yes. here. And then of course slash along the lines of competitive intelligence, which is only a sub sub niche topic yes. usually in a company, right? That, that's actually a very interesting issue, Ryan, and, and it's been discussed for, I think, as long as knowledge management has <laughs> been around. How do you demonstrate the value of a knowledge management initiative? Um, people have tried to um, demonstrate through scorecards, through intellectual property, intellectual asset monitors, how knowledge has some value, but the challenge with it is the most valuable stuff is tacit, it's intangible. So by definition, it's, it can't be measured. It can't be measured in the, the same quantifiable numerical way that you can measure uh, a dollar value. Um, one of the best ways I've found of demonstrating value of knowledge management or the things we're talking about today is, I'm afraid, through anecdote, through um, case study. Okay. Okay. Good. I think this is kind of hinting in the right direction. Then, obviously, is there? A, why wouldn't you? Use, the question is, why wouldn't you use software for these techniques? Brackets, especially when you're talking about 500,000 people, sort of coming to a place or coming together. So, over my head, this is obviously along the lines of organizing meetings like that must be a nightmare, given time zones, giving travel expenses, giving, of course, opportunity costs and stuff like that. And here we have software on the other end, as we all know. There's collaborative software, there's all kind of Facebook, Wikipedias, and other, other stuff around. So, why your claim for don't use IT here? Uh, Rana, I'm afraid I couldn't hear you very clearly just then. The, the line has gone very garbled. Okay, the question is, why wouldn't you use or recommend software for these techniques, especially within larger groups? So you were talking about 500, 1,000 people, which obviously must cost money, travel expenses, opportunity costs, as well as a simple issue as in organize a group like that, which is kind of a big uh, effort. <laughs> I, I'm afraid. I'm really afraid. I can't. I can't understand the question, Rainer. So, what kind of software is there to un, to support these techniques? That's the question. I, I do though see a, a question in the in the chat function, which perhaps I could respond to. Okay. Um, so, one of our friends in India has asked a question um, in a very large organisation with over three hundred thousand employees. Um, it does seem very difficult to connect with them across the organization. Are there any thoughts on that? Um, well, yes, the idea of randomized coffee trials, for example, works across any size organization. Because it's an opt-in process, if the invitation goes out to, in principle, 300 people, um, a large number of those 300,000 could opt in and receive um, a pairing, an invitation to have a, a conversation, an informal conversation. And because they're not directed, they're not anticipated meetings, they don't have to have any specific um, agenda, any specific um, organization. You only need to make sure that the, the participants, the pairing, sit in a, a comfortable time zone, uh, within a comfortable time zone difference and let them make that acquaintance and develop the shared experience. Um, clearly, an unconference is a, is a different question uh, and does require a physical participation. Um, so I, I would suggest that within an organization of 300,000, there are logical parts of the organization, maybe functional areas or departments that could themselves um, organize uh, unconference sessions, and they could be taken at that level. Okay, and and there's another follow-up from this very uh, participant here. Can't we use bulletin boards slash forums sort of technology to avoid logistic issues? 
I'm afraid I can't understand at all, Rainer. It's it's very springy voice coming out. I, I don't understand it. Sorry. Oh, if you, if you just read the next question in the chat function. Jonathan? I, I, I don't understand anything, I'm afraid. I, I, I hear your voice, but I, I don't understand. Okay, I'm just sending you a message now. Sorry, we have a bit of a technical issue. <laughs> so, we can play a little bit like that. Okay? Okay. So, Jonathan, can you now read uh, this can, question? Yes, I, I see. Can, can we use bulletin boards or forums or some sort of technology to avoid logistic issues? Yes. yes, of course you can use bulletin boards and forums. One of the challenges there is so you're creating a kind of artificial environment. You're creating um, some barriers. Not everyone is comfortable using bulletin boards. As you can see at this very moment, technology doesn't always work. There are uh, you know, very often things that fail even within the simplest of bulletin boards. The value of, of a bulletin board is that you will have the asynchronous opportunity having that um, conversation over a number of hours, but you won't have the opportunity of having what we typically see as FaceTime, developing that experience, the, the trust of having met someone, uh, having discussed something of mutual interest face to face. Um, they're useful clearly for capturing thoughts, capturing ideas, sharing documents, dare I say, uh, but they have their limitations. I wouldn't rule them out in the same way that I said right at the beginning. Uh, systems have their place. Um, and certainly, if you have a larger organization, being able to organize and create the conditions uh, does require some use of background technology but it's not the solution in and of itself. Okay, thank you very much. But just continue reading the next question. Okay, so another question. In some organizations, extracting some competitive information from employees about their past employers is considered unethical. How do you deal with such situations? Well, indeed, it may be unethical. It may also be uh, contractually not allowed. So where it is permitted, um, so it's not prevented, um, I think this is the kind of subjective decision that the person who has got the knowledge needs to make. Uh, I've seen examples where somebody has been a, a, an expert in a specific area, proprietary area, but the experience, the why decisions were made, the know why isn't itself proprietary, it's not uh, confidential at that level and can be articulated. Uh, there tends to be more of a barrier, I think, around a person's willingness to talk about things that are very close to being confidential, even though they may not be actually confidential. Um, but as with all ethical decision making, it, it is specific to the context um, of the example in question. Okay, Jonathan, if you just read the next question. Okay, so how to convince someone who's not willing to contribute or even sabotages these uh, these formats? Well, I think that I don't have a, an easy solution, I'm afraid, for someone who sabotages these sorts of formats. I've, I've never found someone in my limited experience who's sabotage or who's been dangerous. Unwillingness to contribute is always a challenge, in particular because th there's a notion that we know more than we can say and we say more than we can write down, but saying something in the first place has to have the right conditions. So the difference between having something documented and having something openly and willingly articulated is very, very big. The closest you will get to somebody openly and willingly sharing what they know, their insights, is if you have, if you give them, um, you know, that explicit um, trust, the, the 
um, opportunity to share warts and all, things that didn't work. Um, don't expect that, that, that they will be um, criticized for, for saying something if it happens to be an opinion or an observation. And this is difficult for organizations to do because most organizations don't like to talk about things that didn't work. They don't like to talk about errors or, or personal uh, mistakes. Having an, an, an environment in which it is safe to fail, so a play on this idea of fail safe, it is safe to fail, is an opportunity for people to express uh, where things haven't gone particularly well. And it encourages uh, people to articulate where otherwise they would just keep quiet. But a very, very good question. OK, thank you. So please continue. Go to the next one. Jonathan? Okay, so you just mentioned um, there's another point here about the wisdom of crowds. A very important issue, um, but in fact, uh, there, there's one big caveat about the wisdom of crowds. I guess what I've been talking about to some extent is the wisdom of crowds, but the issue might arise around groupthink. So there can be a subtle distinction between wisdom of crowds and groupthink. And, and you, you, have to, you have to be very cognizant of that as you go into some of these conversations. Are you developing true wisdom of a collective? Or are you developing a lot of yes men, a lot of the um, collective agreement? Because that's the, the behavior of the organization. So some of the more um, technical, some of the more complex techniques um, tend to involve um, things like scenario planning. Um, you know, looking, there's a technique called future backwards, which um, takes a, a kind of scenario-based approach um, to a particular situation, a particular challenge. Um, but it's implying exactly the same fundamental principles. How do we encourage that elicitation, informal sharing of knowledge or ideas? Um, getting the right people together, having the right people in the room, the ability to move between conversations, the uh, trust, the, the safe to fail environment that, uh, that, that people are encouraged to talk about what they've experienced. Uh, you know, even the most sophisticated technique can fail if it doesn't involve uh, if it doesn't involve um, trust, openness, that condition that, that will allow people to talk. Okay, I think we are pretty much done. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks to everybody to for attending our session. Um, I think we are. We had a very interesting session and with a lot of food for thought and many new ideas. And I hope you will all go to this kind of let's try it. Let's simply kick it out and, and see what's coming up. Because in the end, there's a huge potential benefit in for everybody. Yeah. So if you're interested, please uh, check out our inside section of our website. They will find this webinar in a few days and of course many others. Uh, Jonathan mentioned already our upcoming conference that's pretty much in a week's time. So exactly 19th, 20th, 21st and 22nd of April we're meeting in Bad Nauheim for two days conference and pre and post uh, workshops. This is where you could meet Jonathan as well and a lot of other people from the scene. And then of course check out our um, workshops coming up throughout the year. So thanks a lot everybody, enjoy your day wherever you are and hope to see and hear you soon. Bye bye.